Amidst all the discussion of whether atheistic evolution or special creation is true, there is a group that has arisen that claims that both are true. They believe that God exists. To some extent, they believe that the Bible is God's Word, but they also believe in the general theory of evolution to some extent. A few years ago, I was teaching in a seminar similar to this one, and I was talking about problems with Big Bang Theory. And I was going through how Big Bang teaches that from a small little period-sized dot, uh, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into that er uh, area, and then it exploded. And allegedly, as Kyle has already discussed for us uh, in this seminar, uh, allegedly from that bang that occurred, everything in the universe exists. Well, I was talking about various problems with that theory. And clearly showed that one cannot logically believe that that could happen in view of various laws of science. Well, there was several young people from a Christian college there in attendance uh, that weekend, and one of them came up to me after that lesson, and she seemed very troubled. She was a senior biology major at this particular Christian university that she loved very much, had planned on doing graduate work there, and she came up to me and she said, Eric, I really believe everything you said, but I'm troubled by the fact that from what I can gather, listening to my science teachers, it seems that every one of them at this Christian college believes in the validity of the Big Bang. Well, that's sad to hear, but unfortunately we hear things like that far too often. People who call themselves Christians claiming that you can believe in the Big Bang and you can believe in creation at the same time. At the same university I visited a few months later, you can see several different posters and things that they have hanging up on the wall and in glass cases that indicates to you a little bit about what they are teaching about both creation and evolution. There's one poster hanging up in their science building which says about 325 million years of Earth history can be seen in the exposed rock formations of the Colorado Plateau between Cedar Breaks National Monument and Canyonlands National Park. These rock formations allegedly yield reminders of a younger world before the coming of men. Reminders like dinosaur tracks and amphibian tracks, fossilized bones and petrified wood, even ancient ripples and raindrops. About 60 million years ago, complex forces began to push up the sedimentary rocks. And so you quickly get this idea after visiting a Christian campus like the one this young lady was from that they believe in long, vast geologic ages, and yet supposedly in creation at the same time. Notice that some of the reminders of this world long before the coming of men included the dinosaur tracks. Not too far from where this poster was located at that time, you can go down the hall and look in a glass case at several different uh, skulls and other fossils or fossil replicas. And one of those is a replica of a velociraptor claw. Velociraptor is a dinosaur. Well, according to this particular university, they said that this claw goes back to a time owned by velociraptor, goes back 65 to 100 million years ago. It seems that various ones at this university, like in a lot of universities, even that claim some affiliation with Christianity, that they are not aware of a lot of the evidence, as has been presented so far in the seminar, against the Big Bang Theory, and evidence for the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, and them living not millions of years ago together, but just in the last few hundred or thousand years. Not too far from where this fossil replica is located, we walked into a science classroom where we were introduced to a poster that covered about a fourth of the wall in this science classroom. Now, a lot of people look at a poster like this and they think, well, you know, what does that mean? What is it teaching? Most people aren't aware of what this kind of poster is teaching. It's teaching exactly what evolutionary theory says. It's teaching you had that single-celled organism that came from dead, lifeless matter billions of years ago, and that single-celled organism evolved into a multicellular organism, and that multicellular organism evolved into a worm, that evolved into a fish, that evolved into an amphibian, that evolved into a reptile, that evolved into a lower mammal, and a lemur, and a monkey, and man. And so, 
months earlier, having been told about what some of her Christian professors believe about the Big, Big Bang, I quickly began to find out how more and more of the professors there apparently are teaching some things about evolution that are supposedly true, which are not, and how somehow the biblical account of creation simply can be fit into this evolutionary timetable. I was talking to a young lady at another Christian school uh, some years back and she was telling me she sat in a cultural anthropology class and was told that Lucy, also known as Australopithecus afarensis, you know why they call her Lucy now, that she was probably one of our ancient ancestors that lived about three million years ago. A lot of people at universities, they have been taught by various ones. Some of our brethren who teach things like the sun has been in its present kind of thermonuclear reaction, he said, about 4.5 billion years. Another indication of the age of our system. The same brother said, evolution and the Bible show amazing agreement on almost all issues and one is not mutually exclusive of the other one. Friends, the fact of the matter is there are a lot of problems when you try to combine the theory of evolution with the Genesis account of creation. Because, so you see, what we read in Genesis is that on day one, God made the heavens, the earth, and light. And on day two, He made a firmament. And on day three, He made the land to appear up out of the water. He formed the seas. He caused vegetation to form on that land. On day four, He made the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavenly bodies, you see. On day five, He made birds and fish. On day six, He made land, animals, and man, and He rested on day seven. Now, that does not fit very well with evolutionary theory. You see, evolution teaches that the sun was around long before the earth, and yet Genesis 1 teaches, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You see, there on day one. The water that was divided on day two was already there, you see, on day one, because the earth was full of water on that day, and the land had not yet appeared, and would not appear until day three. But you see, evolution teaches there was land, and the water seeped up out of the land. Well, the Bible tells us there was water first and then there was land. Evolution teaches that land animals called dinosaurs evolved into uh, birds which were created, according to Genesis, a day before those land animals were created. There are a lot of problems when you try to uh, put evolutionary theory and creation together. They do not match up. But where do people get all of these millions of years or the billions of years to try to accommodate evolutionary theory. Well, the fact of the matter is there are only three places for individuals to insert the billions of years needed to accommodate the evolutionary timetable. Only three places. It's really very simple. They could try to put this before the creation week. They could try to put it during the creation week or after the creation week. Well, what about those who attempt to insert the billions of years needed to accommodate evolutionary theory before the creation week. Is it possible? Why do people want to do this? Well, because they want to accommodate the evolutionary timetable. And so the attempt is to say that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 you read God created the heavens and the earth. But then allegedly there was a destruction and then there was a recreation after Genesis 1 one, and then beginning there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. And supposedly Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, throughout the rest of the first chapter of Genesis, you have a makeover. You have a re-creation. There was a creation allegedly. Then there was a destruction. Some say, well that's when God cast Satan out of heaven and cast him onto earth and there was a great war and everything was destroyed. There had originally been you know, rocks and plants and various animals and that's where we get all the fossils today. Is that right? Would someone turn in their Bible for me and tell me where you read that theory about in God's holy word? You don't read about there being this great gap of time, billions of years long, between the beginning of the creation and some kind of re-creation. One of the main arguments that is used for there being a re-creation is that the word make in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11 and many other verses of Scripture does not mean that God made it during the first creation, but it refers allegedly to a re-creation. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. In six days. Well, you see, we, most of us, 
would understand this to mean God made everything, exactly what it says, in six days. But according to those who would like to place billions of years before the six days of creation, this is simply a recreation. I was listening to a radio evangelist some years ago, and he was going on about Exodus 20 and verse 11, and he was telling people how obvious it was that Moses was talking about a recreation, a refashioning of everything that God had originally made billions of years earlier. The main argument that I've heard used by those to say that there are billions of years, or there were before the six days of creation, is that the words make and create mean two totally different things. Well, there's a problem with that. The problem with that is, when the Bible talks about what God created and what God made, the Bible writers use those words interchangeably in regard to what God made and what He did. Notice there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21 where we read, So God created great sea creatures, and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. He created the sea creatures on day five. But then, in the very same chapter, we read on day six, God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. So are we supposed to assume that there was a distinction between God making animals on day six and God creating various kinds of animals? animals on day five? Did he make the fish out of nothing, but then he made the land animals out of something that he had already created billions of years earlier? There is no indication in Scripture that we should interpret these terms this way. Notice later on in Genesis chapter 1, we don't even have to leave Genesis chapter 1 to show that there are serious problems with those who want to fit billions of years of time before the creation week using the argument that make and create in regard to what God did mean two totally different things. Because in Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27, we learn that God made man in His image. And then in the very next verse, we read that God created man in His image. Well, did He somehow create him a long time ago and then recreate him at some other point? Well, notice just a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 5, we read, In the day that God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. I recall that God made man from the dust of the ground. And then He made man, or created woman that is, from the rib of Adam. Well, did He make them? Did He create them? The fact is, there are two different words referring to what God did, referring to God's creation or God's making, meaning the same thing. Just as we use words sometimes today interchangeably, these words are used in Scripture referring to what God did during the creation interchangeably. If I told you that I went outside and cut my grass last week, and then I was talking to someone else and I said, I, I mowed my grass last week, are you going to assume that I'm talking about two different things, that I went outside with a mower and mowed my grass, and then I went out there some other time and took some scissors and began cutting my grass? Well, you understand that I'm using two different words. I do not want to be monotonous, but I'm referring to the same thing. And that's what we have in regard to God's creation. Notice in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, This is the history of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. He created them. He made them. In Genesis 1 and verse 16, what did God do on day 4 of creation? The Bible says, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Well, when the psalmist began talking about the creation and what happened specifically on day four of creation, he said, Praise Him, sun and moon, praise Him, all you stars of light, for He who God commanded and they were created. So the psalmist talked about what took place on day four and he says they were created, yet the word that is specifically used there in Genesis is the word make or the Hebrew word Asa. We can look at passages like in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6, to see where the Bible writer talked about creation again. He said, You, God, have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. Friends, when the Bible talks about God making something or God creating something, it's using two different words to refer to what God did during the six days of creation and not trying to distinguish between what God did billions of years ago in some original first creation and supposedly distinguishing that from what God did during a six-day recreation. As popular as 
that particular idea is. I think a more popular idea is, well, maybe we can fit, maybe we can wedge millions or billions of years between each day of creation. Let's see if we can fit great amounts of time between each day of creation and then we can accommodate the long evolutionary epochs so that we can kind of believe in evolution and creation at the same time. Well, let's very quickly uh, admit that thousands of years or millions of years will not do evolutionists or sympathizers to that theory any good. Let's say that you wedged one million years between each day of creation then you've just added six million years to the age of the earth. And yet the earth is supposed to be billions of years old. So go ahead and try to wedge, though you would be wrong to do so, millions of years between each day of creation. The universe supposedly is 14 billion years old. You're going to need a lot more than a few million years, according to evolutionists, to accommodate their theory. Well, did God create everything in six billion years? Could you fit a billion years between each day of creation? Again, there is nothing in Scripture that would hint that such actually is the case. In fact, when Bible writers commented on creation, they commented on how powerful God was and how simply He created everything with the breath of His mouth. Notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 33, "...by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the, by the breath of His mouth. For He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast." Is there any hint in Scripture? Is there any idea that God initiated a process, and He allowed this process to take billions of years? No. The Bible tells us He commanded and they were created. That is how powerful our God is. I believe that someone who is trying to fit all this time, evolutionary time, into Genesis, there is, in a sense, they are uh, depleting God of some of the, His power. Our God is almighty. Now, God could have created everything in six billion years had He chose to, or six million years, or six thousand years, or six minutes. But He told us exactly what He did in six days, and the Bible tells us that it didn't take him using evolutionary processes, that he did it with the breath of his mouth. Now, admittedly, the word day from the Hebrew word yom is used in a variety of ways in Scripture. It's used in Genesis chapter 1 to refer to the opposite of night. The daylight hours, the light hours were called day. The darkness was called night. And so the word day there is used to refer to the opposite of night. The word day can be used to refer to a period of time in the future that's not necessarily a 24-hour day. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Not a 24-hour period. The Bible uses the word day in that sense from time to time. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, I believe the word day there is used to refer to the total days of creation. So there are times when the word day is used to mean something other than a 24-hour period. But most of the time when you read this word, especially in conjunction with creation and numbers and so forth, it's used in a literal sense. And the key to understanding the word day is to look at it within its context and to see how the Bible writers used this word. Well, what we find in Genesis chapter 1 is God defined what a day is for us. A day is a period of daylight and darkness. A period of darkness and daylight. One period of darkness, one period of daylight, that equals one day. And that is made very clear in the first five verses of your Bible. It has an evening and it has a morning. What's more, the words evening and morning are used together in the Old Testament with the word day over 100 times in non-prophetical literature. Each time, day refers to a literal 24-hour day. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day. The fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. Every day of creation, the Bible was very clear, had an evening and had a morning. If everywhere else in Scripture and non-prophetical language like that found in Genesis chapter 1, we are to understand that as literal days, then why shouldn't we understand that as a literal day in Genesis chapter 1? Not only that, if each day had an evening and a morning, and on day 3 of creation... In Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, God made, as we sometimes sing, grass, flowers, and trees. What would happen to that grass, to all those flowers and trees, if one day was a billion years long and you had a half a billion years of darkness and a half a billion years of daylight? What is going to happen to most plants during a half a billion years 
of darkness. You see, this theory begins, we begin to see that it simply will not work when we look at Genesis chapter 1 for what it says. Not only that, when the insects are created a few days later, are they separated by the plants that they pollinate by two or three days? Or are they separated by two or three billion years? You see, if you try to wedge billions of years between each day of creation, you develop, you make some problems with Genesis chapter 1 simply that you cannot get around. What's more, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, we read the word years and days in this chapter in verse 14. How do we understand the word year here? It doesn't mean day. It doesn't mean month. It doesn't mean billions of years. We understand the word year to mean year. Well, then why shouldn't we understand the word in this chapter day to mean literal days? We can understand the word year. Then why can't we understand what the word day is? Well, some say, but Eric, I've read in my Bible somewhere before that one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So the days of creation must have been long periods of time. If I had a dollar for every time I heard someone bring up this verse or a, a misquotation of that verse... I could probably get rid of my 1997 Saturn, it's very old now, and get a new car. Probably much needed. But no one's giving me money for their quotations or misquotations of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. The fact is, 2 Peter 3 8 has nothing to do with how long the days of creation were. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 does not say one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Notice the text says, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. It is a figure of speech. Not only that, when you look at the context of 2 Peter chapter 3, he's dealing with those who would come in latter times scoffing at the idea that the Lord is going to return. And Peter wants his readers to understand that the Lord is going to return. And he makes the statement about one day in a thousand years because he wants them to see whether Jesus promised this a day ago or a thousand years ago, it's as good as if He promised this today or yesterday. Unlike humans, oftentimes we make statements and sometimes promises that when time passes, we forget about our promises. We don't always keep our promises. That's not a good thing, but if I tell my wife, I'll feed the dogs tomorrow, or I'll take out the trash next week, it's very possible that I'm going to forget that. I don't intend to, but sometimes I do. Well, God doesn't forget His promises. We read in the very next verse that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. You see, the day of the Lord that He talks about there in that passage is the day that Jesus is going to return. And Peter wants us to know that if Jesus promised to return, it's as good as done. It's as good as if He promised it yesterday, even though He may have promised it a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. This passage has nothing to do with how long the days of creation were. Not only that, consider the fact that the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to write this passage where he used the word day, he used the word year. There's obviously a difference here because we have a comparison between the two and the comparison would not make any sense if we could not understand the difference between a day and a thousand years. So in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, we can understand the difference between a day and a thousand years. God could communicate that difference to us. Could God not also have communicated that difference back in Genesis chapter 1? He certainly could have. And I contend that He did. He used the word day. He used the word year. There were other words that could have been used to refer to long periods of time if that's what the days of Genesis really were. But that is simply not what He did. Notice also what Arthur Williams wrote in Creation Research Annual a few years back. He said, We have failed to find a single example of the use of the word day in the entire Scripture where it means other than a period of 24 hours when modified by the use of the numerical adjective. When there is a number connected with the word day, Arthur Williams says, and many other writers have made this same observation, it always means a literal day. Is it ever coupled with a number there in Genesis chapter 1? And the evening and the morning were what? First day, or day one, day two, the second day, 
day three, day four, day five, day six. You see this right there in Genesis 1. Now, if we interpret this word everywhere else in our Bibles to mean a regular day when coupled with a number, why would we not do the same in Genesis chapter 1? And why would we not when other passages talk about creation being done in six days? Furthermore, when you find a plural of the word day from the Hebrew yom or the plural yamim, it appears over 700 times in the Old Testament. And it always means a 24-hour day when it is found in non-prophetical passages like that in Genesis chapter 1. Well, when you read Exodus chapter 20, and you read that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, how are we to understand the term six days? How do you understand the story of the Israelites walking around Jericho one time a day for six days. Did they do it for six days? Did they do it for six years or six thousand years? We understand there is a number, a number coupled with the word day and it means six days and they did it seven times on the seventh day. Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. Not three thousand years, not three hundred years, not three months. We understand what the word means. But for some reason we are not to understand that in Exodus chapter 20, right after God had said the Israelites were to work six days and take off the seventh day, and they understood that as regular days, that right after that, in verse 11, that the six days of creation weren't really six days of creation. We cannot insert billions of years logically before the creation week. You can't do it during the creation week. And you certainly cannot do it after the creation week. In fact, I have never run into anyone. I have never been approached by anyone or read anyone's writings who said, we can fit the 14 billion years that we need to go back to the, the Big Bang or the beginning of time after man is on earth. And so even evolutionists would not place the billions of years needed for their theory after the arrival of man. You can't fit this time before creation. You can't fit it during creation logically and scripturally. And no one that I know of tries to do it after creation. There's one thing the Bible points out several times in Scripture. And it's a phrase that is called the foundation of the world. There are some things the Bible tells us occurred before the foundation of the world. Notice that in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, You love me before the foundation of the world. Notice that Peter said Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, Paul wrote. Clearly the Bible makes a distinction between things that occurred before the foundation of the world and things that came after the foundation of the world. The Bible also makes a distinction between things that came soon after the foundation of the world and things that came long after the foundation of the world. Now notice that if the evolutionary timetable is correct, then man did not arrive on the scene before or soon after the foundation of the world, but eons later. If they believe the universe is 14 billion years old, then 13.99, approximately 6 billion years later, man came onto the scene. You see, if the Big Bang did occur 14 million years ago, and man in some way or fashion or form came around two or three million years ago and maybe we were a little similar to our alleged ape-like ancestors, then you see we are separated from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world, according to this timetable, by billions of years, by 13.99, approximately 6 billion years. If you were to take a 24-hour day, man's time on earth would represent a measly two seconds in a 24-hour day if evolution or if the Big Bang occurred back at 12 a.m. What does the Bible have to say about how long man has been on the earth? Does it indicate to us that man is separated from the beginning of the creation or from the foundation of the world by long vast periods of time? What we find in passages like Luke chapter 11 verses 50 and 51 what we find is Jesus making a statement like, The blood of all the prophets was shed from the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Now the prophets' blood, have, their blood has been shed since when? Since millions of years after the creation of the world or since 
the foundation of the world. You see, Jesus gave us a hint here of how long man has been on the earth. And He says that man's been here since the foundation of the world. The prophets, their blood has been shed since the foundation of the world. And then He connected Abel to this time. Not Zechariah, but Abel has been here since the foundation of the world. Abel has been here and was here a lot longer before Zechariah was here. His time, being the son of the first man that God created, Adam, from the dust, he has been here since the foundation of the world. Is man separated from the beginning of the universe by billions of years? Notice what Jesus said in Mark 10 and verse 6. He said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Did He say that after the creation began, after the evolutionary process took over, billions of years later, man came onto the scene? He makes a simple statement. From the beginning of creation, not the end of creation, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. How could you take this statement and somehow make it coincide with statements like, well, man is a Johnny-come-lately. He's a newcomer to this earth. We supposedly believe in God. We supposedly believe in the Bible. But we also believe in the long ages of evolutionary time. And so man has to be separated from the beginning of the creation by millions of years. Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And notice what the Apostle Paul had to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. He said, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice he did not say, after billions of years of time, man began perceiving the nature of God and who God is. Paul wrote, since the creation of the world, His, God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Animals aren't understanding God. The context here is not of angels understanding God. It's of man understanding something about God. Since when? Since 13.996 billion years since the universe began? No, since the creation of the world. Man is not separated from the beginning of time by billions of years. And if, if someone is going to try to fit evolutionary time, the billions of years that they say they need for their theory to work, even though we've already seen it won't work, given trillions of years, but if they try to, they're going to have to fit that somewhere into the Bible timeline, before, during, or after creation. And these three passages right here in Luke 11, and in Romans chapter 1 and Mark chapter 10 clearly show us that Jesus said, no, man has been here since the beginning of time and you can't have billions of years before that time. Man has been here since that time. I certainly wish that we could find posters such as this not in our Christian college classrooms. I wish that we would not go into science buildings and find statements like, well, this dinosaur claw dates back 65 to 100 million years. Or that we wouldn't see posters in the walls of our Christian universities like this which teach we evolved from slime. Now, I have to say that it may be, and I would like to hope, that there are various professors in Christian universities who use these simply as a teaching tool to say, well, this isn't true, but maybe you need to know this information. That said, I can't imagine us having posters in a building like this that show what evolution teaches, that shows all sorts of false doctrines and not have anything on the walls like the six days of creation. Why can't we go into science classrooms in schools run by our brethren and see posters like this. On day one, God created the heavens, the earth, and light. On day two, He created a firmament and an expanse that divided waters from waters. On day three, He made land. On day four, He did this. On day five, He did this. Folks, that is scientific. People may say, well, that's not very scientific. Evolutionary theory doesn't really say this. I didn't learn that in graduate school. Well, you know what? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them in six days. The Bible tells us He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And if there's anyone who knows about creation, I assure you that our Lord knows about creation because Jesus did the creating. John said all things were made through Him or by Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. Why can't we see verses like this? Even in science classrooms. 
Certainly in Bible classrooms, but why not in science classrooms? There has never been a scientist walk on this earth that knew more about creation and the beginning of the universe than Jesus Christ, the one who created all things. The creation did not pl take place over six billion years. It did not have a great 14 billion year gap before some alleged recreation. The Bible tells us that in six days of creation, God made everything.